uh, responsibility I have to uh, record these for posterity's sake, and I have no idea where they're going or who, who gets to uh, uh, watch them. Oh, here's Karen Dealman joining us from Denver. Hi, Karen. Yeah, uh, she's not, not in yet, not in yet. I don't, well, I admitted her, I don't see her. Well, oh, yep. let's see. yeah, all right, Karen is here. Yes, hello, Karen. Um, well, you know, I was telling Will beforehand that this is such a, <laughs> a huge topic uh, in terms of it, just the development uh, that has taken, that takes place in a, over a period of about 2,000 2, years. And I, I want to, uh, you know, just remind everybody our, our topic is looking at um, the God of love, or what the, the title says is that the journey to the God of love. And it has been a, a journey for the, the Hebrew people. In order to uh, understand just the developments that happen, we have to realize that when we're reading the text of Scripture, um, even though we want to assume that this is a divinely inspired text, we are also seeing a text that has a very strong human element in it, and the, the understanding is that, um, that humans, whether it's the prophets or the kings or whatever in the Old Testament, um, are developing over time an experience with God that reveals to them gradually who God is. This is a conversation that's going on back and forth. Now, compare that to an assumption that many people have that, you know, the Bible defines who God is because it's God's word that comes straight from God. Um, that's not what we're thinking about here. We, we employ, as I will say in every class I teach, we employ the historical critical method, which seeks out, you know, how it is that human beings came to write these texts in their context to whom were these texts being written and why were they being written? And every one of the texts has a, a certain uh, perspective that is trying to be co conveyed. I should also say that uh, we didn't really have time to think about this, but the, the Old Testament or the First Testament as it's sometimes called, uh, was written over a period uh, from about uh, 950 to about 400 of, of before the Common Era. So that's about 550 years. Prior to 950, there were oral traditions that were kept alive by various uh, clans, tribal groups living in the land of Canaan who saw themselves as descendants of, um, uh, of Abraham or the, the Hebrew people. Now, Rich, uh, uh, I can't remember Richard's last name. Huh? R Richard last, last week wrote- uh, Oh, last Richard McKenzie. Mackenzie, gosh, I'm sorry. Oh, he has a great question. Hey, is this just hearsay we're talking about? And no, it's not. I mean, uh, oral traditions are ritualized traditions. Uh, think about what's happening right now with Rosh Hashanah, you know, yesterday morning, and people going to the synagogue or, uh, or Passover. You know, there are stories that are told, but there are also ritual acts that take place that help people kinesthetically to remember the story. So whether it's breaking of bread or, you know, uh, telling the story around the, the Passover table and pouring the wine uh, and uh, remembering uh, the, the escape, the exodus from Egypt. So oral traditions just aren't, you know, uh, stories that are made up, but they are traditions that are told at particular times of the year that give people a sense of their identity. And give people a sense of participating in that identity as well. Uh, so for the longest time, traditions were kept orally until the kings start to uh, establish themselves in Israel. Uh, and the first king who really wrote uh, the official story of, um, of the Israelites was, was Solomon. That's something referred to as the Yahweh's tradition. You might know that in you know, shortly after Solomon's death in 922, the, the kingdom of Israel split into two uh, groups, Judah in the south and Israel in the north. 
And before you know it, Israel in the north has their own tradition called the Elois tradition. Later on, uh, and, and this is where we were talking about King Josiah, King Josiah in 620, around that er, uh, time period, he writes another addition to the two traditions, the Yahwist and the Elois. So this is developing over time. And uh, each time a new tradition is added to uh, the mix, uh, there are certain questions that are trying to be uh, answered. Uh, for King Josiah, uh, at the, by this time, the, the northern kingdom of Israel had been co had completely destroyed, the so-called lost tribes of Israel. The Assyrians destroyed them. Judah alone remained, small little Judah, just two tribes, uh, not very many people, not very wealthy, really, when it came down to it. But Josiah, uh, around 620, felt that, uh, you know, Israel the people of God needed to be reminded of their covenant responsibility. So he has commissioned this Deuteronomistic history. And, and recognize what these kings are trying to do. They're trying to tell the story, the official story, right? That people will uh, see themselves as part of. And it's in this official story, uh, the Deuteronomistic tradition, uh, that where we left off last time. And, and this is where Josiah uh, wants people to understand how important is uh, this covenant idea is. And it's a kind of if then situation. If you are you know, uh, uh, observant of God's covenant, if, which is summarized nicely in the 10 commandments, then uh, if you keep the commandments and walk in God's ways, God will reward you. But if you don't do that, let me give you my full screen now. If you don't do that, uh, if you don't obey God's laws uh, and observe his commandments and decrees, which I am commanding you, then all these curses shall come upon you and overtake you. And uh, a whole chapter, literally a whole chapter in Deuteronomy uh, ensues that involves everything from fire and brimstone and all of this. So we get this very clear sense uh, that, uh, you know, he thinks the lady doth protest too much, you know, like, like why, why is it that uh, Josiah uh, talks very, very, in very uh, limited terms about the, the blessings, but then elaborates, elaborates, elaborates the curses. And the question that I wanted to pose is, I think Josiah, in doing this, was uh, uh, creating an expedient historical narrative that would help him consolidate uh, the people of Judah who were, you know, in the dire political circumstances that they found themselves in, uh, were, you know, threatened on all sides. They could easily be assimilated into other cultures, which, in fact, happened uh, eventually. Uh, so Josiah didn't just make this stuff up <clears throat> at the time. It, the year was around 620 BCE, but there was a long tradition that was associated with the prophets that preceded him. And I wanted to start today by talking about some of you know, these, these curses and, and what transgressing the covenant meant, because it's still relevant to us today. But what's, what's interesting is that at the end of all of these prophetic pronouncements, there is a message of hope. Uh, now, if we continue on in our understanding of how these documents were written, eventually all of the stories that are told of Israel are going to be brought together and edited by a single person or a single group of people, somewhere probably around the year 400 BCE. I haven't told you about the fourth tradition, but you have that Yahweh's tradition, the time of Solomon, the Elois tradition, about 100 years later, 850, then Josiah's Deuteronomistic history. Soon the people are going to be taken off to Babylon, and there they are going to write another tradition called the priestly tradition. Eventually, 400, 400 BCE, an editor is going to take all of these various traditions and weave them together into the text that we now know of as the Old Testament. But in so doing, 
the editor is going to add his or her, no, it's a his, but, or their, his or their own perspective, their own theology. And we see this sprinkled throughout the Hebrew prophets. Most likely the original Hebrew prophet idea was one of great destruction. God is gonna destroy you. Just like Josiah's, uh, uh, just like Josiah's Deuteronomistic history. But at the end of some of these prophetic pronouncements, you get a single chapter that is in no way <laughs> reflective of the character of what's preceded it. It's this image of hope, this image of, yes, but God loves you. God is going to forgive you for your sins and, and call you back into the fold. Just like, all right, we've, we've read 13 chapters of God's wrath and judgment. And now on the 14th chapter or so, I'm thinking of Amos or Hosea, um, we're going to get, you know, this, this, this image of, of God calling the children back. That was a theological uh, transformation, actually, that took place at a time uh, known as the Babylonian captivity, uh, somewhere between 587, 539 BCE. But I, I just wanna give you a couple examples of what I'm talking about. There's a prophet by the name of Amos. Now Amos was writing about 130 years before Josiah. So Josiah probably drew upon a lot of Amos's very harsh language. But Amos was speaking to the people of the Northern Kingdom of Israel, and he was imploring them, you are not following God's covenant. And I, I love some of the language he uses. Um, let me just read Amos chapter two, verses six through 12. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Israel and on, because they sell the righteous for silver and the needy for a pair of shoes. They who trample the head of the poor into the dust of the earth and push the afflicted out of the way. Father and son go into the same girl so that my holy name is profaned. They lay themselves down beside every altar on garments taken in pledge. And in the house of their God, they drink wine bought with fines they impose. Uh, there's, there's so much in that. Um, basically, there, what Amos is talking about is the transgression of the second table of the law. People in Israel are becoming wealthy. They are doing the one thing that is forbidden in Israel, lending money at interest. Hey, I've got I've got five hundred dollars. You have nothing. I will I will rent you some of my money, a hundred dollars, but you have to pay me one hundred fifty dollars back. Right? <laughs> that was that was a deplorable sin throughout Israel. Not so much today. Uh, but two men going into the same girl. They're, we're mostly talking about uh, uh, temple prostitution. Uh, so among the Canaanites, you had uh, prostitutes who would ensure the fertility of your fields if you would go in and have uh, you know, intercourse with her. In so doing, they take uh, garments given to them in pledge. In other words, one of their uh, debtors owes them money and uh, he says, okay, here's my garment, here's my, my cloak for collateral. They take those cloaks, this guy's shivering out in the cold, right? And they go into this temple prostitute, lay that cloak on the ground and have sex with the, the prostitute. This was the kind of deplorable acts that were happening in Israel. And these were the things that, um, uh, you know, Amos just was incensed about. And he talks about the so-called day of the Lord, God's judgment, how, how God is just utterly going to destroy everybody. Let me uh, read that for you if I can. I know today may be, sound like a lot of proof texting, but uh, when we get to talk about prophets that you never really hear about that much. You know, a lot of our preaching in Sunday school or in, on Sunday mornings usually comes from, uh, you know, the New Testament. But there's a lot of good stuff in the first uh, two thirds of this book. Um, let me find the place I need to be here, chapter, or verse 18. Alas for you who desire the day of the Lord. In other words, when God is going to, to come and then set 
Israel at, you know, at the, the height of all the nations where they are gonna be the best in, in the world, right? Uh, top of their game. They call that the day of the Lord when God's glory would be known through all the nations. Yeah, you're really looking forward to that, says Amos. Why do you want the day of the Lord? It's darkness, it's not light, as if someone fled from a lion and was met by a bear, or went into the house and rested a hand against the wall and was bitten by a snake. Is not the day of the Lord darkness, not light, and gloom with no brightness in it? Um, I hate, I despise your festivals, and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the offerings of well-being of your fatted animals, I will not look upon them. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the melody of your harps. But let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. You probably are familiar with that uh, line from Martin Luther King Jr., so what was happening in Israel, people, hey, let's go to the temple and let's, you know, make a big show of our fatted calves and burnt offerings and things like that. But then you walk out of the temple and you're treating your neighbor like, you know, like dirt. Um, God despises that, according to Amos. And because of that, Israel is going to be utterly, utterly destroyed. So let me stop and see if you have any questions about that. This is this destruction that uh, that is is the result of not following the covenant. Uh, Dan, I remember the line from Amos, listen to this, you old cows of Basham. <laughs> right, right. That somehow stuck in my mind. And if you wanted to explain that Basham and all that. Oh, well, ahead. let me let me tell you, uh, it's probably not the best uh, thing to talk about here uh, on, you know, on so soon after the death of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, but uh, this, uh, this prophet is not exactly a feminist, okay? And he sees uh, the sign of any destruction uh, or the downfall of any nation as happening when the women start uh, when the women start bossing the men around. So there's a whole chapter in four where he talks about these cows of Bashan, who are the women who are the uh, recipients or the, uh, uh, the benefactors of, of all of this injustice. Uh, their husbands are the ones that are going out and selling the poor for a, you know, a pair of sandals and things like this. And this is what Amos says. Hear this word, you cows of Bashan, who are on Mount Samaria, who oppress the poor, who crush the needy, who say to their husbands, bring me something to drink. The Lord God has sworn by his holiness, the time is surely coming upon you when they shall take you away with hooks, even the last of you with fish hooks. Through breaches in the wall you shall leave, each one straight ahead, and you shall be flung out into Harmon. Come to Bethel and transgress to Gilgal and, and multiply transgression. Well, and then he goes on. Um, but, you know, women telling their husbands what, what to do, lounging on beds of, of ivory and, uh, you know, telling, telling uh, their, their hubby to go get them something to drink and that winter at it, bring me something to eat. This is, I mean, this is utter chaos, obviously, when the women are telling men what to do. Uh, and another example of, you know, just how far uh, Israel has gotten from the covenant. So it, it's, it's these kinds of acts of transgression, of injustices that are perfectly justified, uh, that are justifiable, I guess, to God to, to destroy Israel. This, this little experiment he had, he's going to call a people out of Egypt, give them a covenant so that they can be a an example to the rest of the world of how to be human. This is really what it boils down to. You all have lost sight of what it means to be human. I, God, am going to give you this covenant. And by following that covenant, you will be able to achieve your true humanity. And true humanity lies in justice and righteousness. Let justice roll down like mighty waters and righteousness like ever flowing streams. Um, there's another prophet, Hosea, who 
also is along these lines. And Hosea is another one of these northern prophets. And he has an interesting take on things. God tells Hosea to go out and marry a whore, a prostitute. This is supposed to be a metaphor for what Israel has done in going after other gods. You know, so now we're looking at the first table of the law. You know, you shall have no other gods before me. Israel has basically prostituted themselves uh, to the other gods. And throughout Hosea, you see this sure destruction that is going to come uh, to Israel because of their... Um, because they're of their apostasy. But I wanted to look at Hosea particularly because um, it's here that we see a really good example. When we get to the last chapter of, of Hosea, after we hear all of this destruction that is going to come upon the Israelites, uh, you hear this uh, redemption uh, aspect that, that gets, I, I, will, I will say it right, right out, many people will be upset by this, but most likely this was added after the fact. You remember when the editor is putting together all of these tales, and the editor is doing so with 300 years of extra history that was not available to Amos or Hosea. The editor is able to impose, you might say, his theological perspective from his point in history after so much has taken place. And it is a history that sees God not as judge, but as redeemer. Something happens in that period of time between Amos and then the final writing of the Old Testament, where there is a transition between seeing God as the you know, the tribal God in the sky who's going to destroy his people and destroy, you know, everything, fire and brimstone kind of God, to a God who speaks tenderly to uh, God's people. And this is what Hosea says after, you know, meeting out the punishments that, uh, or talking about the punishments, uh, about what God will do. Oh, return, I'm in uh, Hosea chapter 14, Return, O Israel, to the Lord your God, for you have stumbled because of your iniquity. Take words with you and return to the Lord. Say to him, take away all guilt, accept that which is good, and we will offer the fruit of our lips. Assyria shall not save us. We will not ride upon horses. We will, not say, we will say no more, our God, to the work of our hands. In you, the orphan finds mercy. So there's a redemption that's taking place here. I will heal their disloyalty. I will love them freely, says God, for my anger has turned from them. I will be like the dew to Israel. He shall blossom like the lily. He shall strike root like the forests of Lebanon. His roots shall spread out. His beauty shall be like the olive tree and his fragrance like that of Lebanon. Uh, they shall again live beneath my shadow. They shall flourish as a garden. They shall blossom like the vine. Their fragrance shall be like the vine and the wine of Lebanon. Um, okay, gee, this is kind of a schizophrenic God here. <laughs> this God is just going to destroy everything. But now we see, at, and, and there's one in Amos as well, totally uncharacteristic, totally uh, incongruent, with what has proceeded. So it seems that there's some evidence that there was somebody from his theological perspective many years down the line saying that old Amos, that Hosea, they didn't understand God the way we do now after the last several hundred years. And we'll talk about those several hundred years. We now know that God is a God of redemption, that God is a God of faithfulness to God's people. So we don't want to say that Amos and Hosea, you know, they, they weren't writing uh, important material. They were. They just didn't have the whole picture. So we, the editors, we're going to add the rest of the story. Okay, so it's hard for me to do this without a board, but if we're on a timeline, the editors know something 
that Amos and Hosea don't know about God? How did they get to the point where they came to know God in a different way? So let me stop there and see if there are any questions. Am I, I, this is convoluted stuff, especially without a chalkboard. To, <laughs> any, any questions? And if so, uh, unmute yourselves. So nice to know I'm perfectly lucid and, and clear on all this. Well, <clears throat> a theological crisis takes place. Uh, the people of Judah, remember this is a small group. Uh, they try to get back on the straight and narrow through God's, you know, uh, through Josiah's reforms. We're gonna follow the covenant, we're gonna do everything. And they, they do a pretty darn good job, really. Uh, Josiah really tries to bring the people back into the fold by making them um, what he's the one that really starts a lot of the, um, uh, I, I guess, covenant ideals that are associated with Jews still today. Circumcision, for example. I, you know, we are going to separate ourselves from the other nations by circumcising our males. That didn't happen until Josiah's reforms. Uh, coming to the temple and uh, celebrating Passover every year, that was something that Josiah instituted as well. No intermarriage, not intermarrying with other, you know, nations, because, you know, you see the problem there. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a good uh, Israelite, and I worship God, my God, but, you know, my wife's a Canaanite, and, you know, she's got Baal and Asherah and all those. So it, it's, uh, you know, uh, in, inter- uh, it, it's, you know, you're mixing cultures too much. So Josiah was the one that really tried to, uh, you know, ensure that the Israelites were uh, kept apart. However, it all came to naught because there was this nation arising in the, in the east, in Babylon. If I can go through all of my, show you where my back up here. All right, see, here's Babylon, over here is Jerusalem, Judah, the years now we're talking about 593 to 587 BCE. Uh, up until this point, Assyria, with its capital at Nineveh, has been the major powerhouse, and the Assyrian armies were, were absolutely brutal and ruthless. They, you know, they just wiped people out. They, they had no interest in mercy whatsoever. But Babylon, uh, just to the south, along the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, um, now is on the rise. And they overwhelm the Assyrians. And before you know it, they are on the march and they come into Jerusalem. And one of the ways you destroy cultures, especially if you believe that your culture, the Babylonian culture, is the dominant one and should be the culture spread across the world. Later, Alexander was going to, Alexander the Great was going to feel the same way is you move into a city like Jerusalem, you take the people out of Jerusalem and put them into your culture, and then you take other destroyed uh, you know, slaves and place them in Jerusalem. So now you have people who have absolutely no cultural artifacts around them to help perpetuate their, um, their, their understanding of religion, their understanding of social norms, and usually by a generation. Uh, you become assimilated into the dominant culture. Uh, this, is, this is what the Babylonians were trying to do. So um, in 593 to 587, the Babylonians move into Jerusalem. They destroy the temple. Uh, and in waves, they begin taking people out of Jerusalem and putting them uh, in a basically a refugee camp along the Kevar River in, in Babylon. And it's there that the Israelites are completely um, vulnerable. They no longer have a temple, which was central to their worship, right? Because we sacrifice to God, and we, we do all these things. We need a temple. They no longer have a king because, hey, you know, uh, Nebuchadnezzar is the king. Uh, you refugee people, you, you can't have your own king. So now the priests have to take over uh, the, uh, the leadership of the group. 
And it's in this exile, as it's referred, that new theological questions start to get posed. The first one is, I thought, you know, I thought we were on the straight and narrow. Apparently we weren't, you know, according to Josiah, if we followed the covenant, God would not uh, destroy us. And we were following the covenant. We were doing everything we were supposed to do. We're even taking on, you know, uh, new practices that kept us from falling away from the covenant. And what happens? Well, God lets the Babylonians come in and take us away. Doesn't make sense. So, so what's God up to? He, the, apparently, you know, that very logical little uh, formula that Josiah gave us, if you're good, you're, you're rewarded. If you're bad, you're punished. It doesn't work. Well, some people were saying, well, you know, we, we just weren't good enough and we weren't following the law well enough. So the priests in Babylon begin to elaborate all of these incredibly picayune laws. And they're the ones that are going to write the books of Leviticus and Numbers. And if you've ever read these books, it's just, just law after law after law after law. It's really a, a, um, an elaboration or a commentary on the Ten Commandments. Uh, and this is where you shall not suffer a witch to, to live. And, you know, uh, all of these sexual prohibitions, all of these uh, eating prohibitions, uh, this is where, you know, there are certain animals that you can eat and those you can't eat. And this is how you are going to separate yourself from the Babylonians. If we can create a wall, a cultural wall around ourselves, we do these things the Babylonians don't, then our culture can survive. And that's what the priests had in mind. And that's what many Jews still today have in mind. And, you know, we have our ultra-Orthodox uh, rabbis here in town. They are the inheritors, in many ways, of this tradition, the strong legalism. Uh, but there are other people, other priests, who are a little bit more philosophical about this, and they come to reflect a little bit more theologically on just who God is. And they come to this assumption, they come to this realization that you know, um, these Babylonian gods, these other Assyrian gods, they, they really don't exist. Our God is a universal God. He is the God over all. Not, he's not just a tribal God among many, right? You shall have no other gods before me, as God said. But this is the God who created the world. Now, why did they start thinking about this? Well, because in Babylon, there was a creation narrative that was relived every year. In fact, it was this, it was <laughs> on this day, well, no, on yesterday, every year, when the, when the Jews, the Hebrews, went to Babylon, their new year began back in March with the Exodus narrative. When they came back from Babylon, they had a new year, Rosh Hashanah, that happens at a, you know, a certain time, usually in September, uh, based upon the moon. Um, why was that? Because the New Year celebration of Babylon with Marduk overcoming Tiamat, the, the two gods, was so central to that culture that it, they could not help but assimilate it into their own. You know, it's like, um, it, it's like Mexican kids coming to the United States and, and, you know, they can't help but, you know, take on the 4th of July as their, you know, a, as a, an important <laughs> holiday for themselves. But in the midst of this, the priests, the Hebrew priests, the people of Judah, they begin to think about, you know, how it is that the world was created. Uh, up until this point, they were only interested in, you know, political issues and how to, to govern their society. But now the Babylonians are saying the world was created this way. The priests come up with this new understanding of um, who their God is. And they write this liturgy that is spoken at the beginning of every, well, the beginning of every day, but mostly the beginning of every synagogue service that they have. The temple is gone. They can't worship in a temple and do, do sacrifices. 
So the concept of a synagogue comes to uh, take the place of the temple. A synagogue is where you come and you, you read uh, the liturgy, you read the Torah, and you are, uh, you're enriched not by sacrifice, but by sacrificing your will on the altar of the Torah, if you will. Now there's a much more psychological and spiritual emphasis on what it means to be a Hebrew or an Israelite or a Jew. This is where uh, the Israelites come to be called Jews. Uh, the people of Judah, the Judahites, the Jews. Uh, in the face of a overarching creation narrative, the priests come up with their own creation narrative. And it begins like this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, upon the face of the deep, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. And then they go through the seven, six days of creation, and on the seventh, God rests. This liturgy, you can tell by the way it's written in Genesis, was a... Uh, was a liturgy. It was, was spoken in worship. It was probably memorized by the people in, um, uh, among, in the synagogue and, and by the Jews. And in so doing, this liturgy reassured the people of Israel that it's not Marduk and Tiamat, the Babylonian gods, who are in control. But, you know, those Babylonians who worshiped the stars and the moon and everything, as Babylonians did, they, they saw them as gods. Guess what, everybody? Our God created them. On the third day, God creates, you know, the luminaries, and um, or is it the fourth day? So now you're beginning to see God not as this tribal God who's concerned about the political, you know, uh, machinations of, of a small uh, community, but as a universal creator God. And this universal creator God works in ways that we just cannot understand. So the previous understanding of God, who is kind of like a king, right? You, you follow my rules and then I reward you. If you don't follow my rules, I punish you. That's so two-dimensional because when we're talking about a God who creates the universe, who, who makes the seasons turn and, and makes the moon, you know, go through its phases, all of those things depend upon God. Who are we to, you know, uh, feel that, you know, we are as special as we once thought we were? There's a wisdom in this that we're just not quite aware of. And so it's in the middle of this that the Israelites come to understand God in a new way. God is a redeemer, but God is not going to redeem according to the logic that they once held as true. God's wisdom is somehow inscrutable. Uh, eventually, the Jews are going to be sent back to Jerusalem. Uh, the Babylonians are gonna be overwhelmed by the Persians. Nebuchadnezzar's reign wasn't very long in uh, 539 BCE, and it's at this time that the, uh, excuse me, I'm trying to find my, my book here. It's this time that the uh, second writing of uh, Isaiah takes place. Isaiah is a, a great big long prophetic book. It has, um, can't remember how, how long we go. I think we go to 1015. So I, I don't want to go, go too far. Isaiah is written in three parts. Uh, there's first Isaiah, second Isaiah, and third Isaiah. Second Isaiah that I'm about to read for you uh, was written right about the time of the Babylonian captivity. First Isaiah was written about 200 years prior to this. Uh, but it is still part of, you know, this Israelite slash Judahite tradition uh, that is a very important. And it's first, or excuse me, it's second Isaiah who really introduces a new theme to the Israelites, to the Jews, about who their God is. 
And you might know this. It's Isaiah chapter 40. And remember the last chapters of the, the Amos and Hosea that we've been talking about. Comfort. Oh, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that she has served her term, that her penalty is paid, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries out, in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, every mountain, hill made low, the uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all people shall see it together, all people, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Um, and then Isaiah says to the people, God has a new plan for you. Um, you have a new calling. Here's what I want you to do. It doesn't make sense to you as a people because you always wanted to see yourselves as high and mighty like King David and King Solomon. You wanted to be the, you know, the, the, uh, the most powerful nation on the world, but in the world. And you wanted all nations to bow down to you. That's not how I'm working. I'm not gonna work that way, says God. Here's what I want you to do. Chapter 42. Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen. Speaking about Israel here. In whom my soul delights, I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break and a dimly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not grow faint or be crushed until he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands wait for his teaching. Thus says God the Lord who created heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and what comes from it, who gives breath to the people and spirit to those who walk in it. And he goes on. Note the, the emphasis here on God the creator, right? This is the God who's created everything. I know it's hard for us to imagine that prior to this, the, the Israelites and the Judahites did not imagine their God as the creator of all. But it's in Babylon that they come to this realization. And with this realization comes a new calling. The one who, you know, stretched the stars out uh, and, you know, created the world has chosen us to do something that does not follow the logic of the world. We were previously following the logic of the world. Might makes right. But this new God whose wisdom is inscrutable has a different calling for us. And so now there's a theological problem because there are going to be many people who want to hold to the old way. You know, if you follow the law, God is going to reward you. If you don't, God is going to punish you. And they are going to form one tradition in Israel upon return to Jerusalem that's going to be very legalistic. Uh, righteousness involves a, a observance of the law, right? If God says don't eat pork, you don't eat pork. If God says don't eat shrimp, you don't eat shrimp. If God says, you know, don't lie with a man, you don't lie with a man, you know. But to others who have experienced this new God, that way seems so two-dimensional, so simple, so unlike a God who created so many mysteries, right? There's got to be room for paradox in the world. So how do you become a light of the nations? Well, one of the ways is known as the centripetal way, is that you be good people by following the law, and everyone else will see what a great uh, example you are, and we'll try to follow along with you. You know, hey, those are good people over there. We should be good like them. The other way, and this is going to be the seed that is going to bear fruit 500 years later in the person of Jesus of Nazareth, is the more centrifugal approach. Righteousness 
involves following the wisdom of God, who is a God of surprises. This God is universal. And if God is universal, then a difficult question arises. Is God's covenant universal? If God created the world and God has everlasting love and steadfast love for God's people, then why does God not have that same love for all people? If God is universal, then isn't God's will for the world, peace, justice, and righteousness, isn't that universal as well? And this is gonna be a tension back and forth between some Jews who believe they're exclusive, that God chooses them as the chosen people, and others who over the next 500 years are gonna just scratch their head a little bit and say, I don't know, you know, it just seems too simplistic that that's the way God would work. And this is the introduction of a new type of literature uh, in, in scripture. It's known as wisdom literature. And you know, uh, you probably know Psalm 8. This is this emphasis upon this God who is a creator. Uh, I'm going to try to find it. I didn't. You probably know this psalm or have heard it, um, but this wonderful sense that, you know, there's mystery in the world and God is the source of that mystery. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens and out of the mouths of babes and infants, you have founded a bulwark because of your foes to silence the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established. What are human beings that you are mindful of them, mortals that you care for them? Yet you have made them a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. You have given them dominion over the works of your hands. You put all things under their feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the sea. You, you might notice that trope several places in, in scripture, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea and whatever pet crawls upon the, uh, upon the ground. That's the creation trope that gets introduced at this time. This emphasis upon a God who is um, a God of mystery, a God of surprises, a God you cannot, uh, I'm trying to find my place here, a God you cannot predict. Um, and that prediction is an affront, really, to God. All of you centripetal people who think that God still wants you to just follow rules in this very simplistic way and to uh, somehow achieve your humanity in that way, yeah, that's good, but there's a whole dimension that you're losing out on. God isn't so easily understood by your rational uh, you know, by, by your rational understanding. There's a wisdom that we can perceive in the world that we just cannot simply understand. And this is where it, this is the place that's so important for us today, where science seems to have chased, you know, mystery out of every corner of the universe, but not every corner, uh, you know, because that wisdom is, is still there. Um, I, I'm kind of rushing to get through this, but I want to make sure I'm giving everyone the opportunity to ask questions. Can I pause here for a second and see if there are any questions? Karen, Lynn, okay. Well then, let me, I, I'll conclude with this and I will come back to it. Uh, actually, I guess we got a little time. I really am not sure if it, we're supposed to end at 1015 or not, so. But this whole tradition called the wisdom tradition, uh, features literature that comes from this period after the Babylonian captivity or, you know, towards the end of the Babylonian captivity, all the way to around 400 uh, before the Common Era. Um, that, that focuses uh, on this mystery of God that is inscrutable. And you may know books like Proverbs, some of the Psalms that uh, I've read, uh, Ecclesiastes, vanity, vanity, hall is vanity, you know. 
nothing makes sense. You know, the, the, the wicked flourish and the righteous are, you know, uh, the, the righteous suffer. Proverbs, the Song of Solomon, uh, this, <laughs> this uh, pian, you might say, to sexuality. Uh, there's something mysterious about sexuality that the, the Hebrews want to emphasize within the bonds of, you know, this uh, fidelity and this relationship between uh, supposedly Solomon, but we know that this book was written uh, long after Solomon was alive. Uh, Proverbs, what am I missing in there? Sections of, you remember the editor would have put some of these things into the existing books already. This emphasis on creation, Genesis chapter one, that has a wisdom motif to it, that the God who created the universe did so in this ordered way that we can't quite understand. But note here something that is going to have uh, an impact on later theology. And it's, the idea of wisdom as hakma is the Hebrew word, but hakma is a feminine noun. And there is this sense that God the Creator and wisdom, hakma, are in a marriage with each other. And we're not saying that there are two gods, but there is this bond between the creator and wisdom, almost as if wisdom informs the creation before it happens. Uh, this is gonna become foundational for a, a lot of Jewish and Christian mysticism. Uh, there's a book called the Kabbalah that uh, will refer back to this, um, this idea. But this is wisdom speaking in Proverbs. Now you might know Proverbs, right? You know, the good man does this, the bad man does this. Uh, but all of this, trying to instill this wisdom that isn't always necessarily logical. And this is wisdom speaking in Proverbs chapter 8, uh, beginning at verse 22. The Lord created me at the beginning of his work, the first of all of his acts long ago. Ages ago, I was set up at the first, before the beginning of the earth. When there were no depths, I was brought forth when there were no springs abounding with water. Before the mountains had been shaped, before the hills I was brought forth, when he had not yet made the earth and fields or the world's first bits of soil. When he established the heavens, I was there. When he, drove, when he drew the circle on the face of the deep, when he made firm the skies above, when he established the fountains of the deep, when he assigned to the sea its limit, so that the waters might not transgress his command when he marked out the foundations of the earth. Then I was beside him like a master worker, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing before him always, rejoicing in his inhabited world and delighting in the human race. So there's this marriage, you might say, this love within God that is akin to the love between a man and a woman, between creator and hakma, uh, or wisdom. And it's this love that bears the fruit of creation. And it's in creation itself that we can see, you know, this wisdom working. Um, this is an idea that is, cannot be confined to a, a logical equation. If you do this, then this will happen because love is not logical. Love uh, between creator and created takes on uh, forms that are mysterious, that are paradoxical. So with that, we have been introduced to the idea of God as love, not God as tribal uh, warrior, not God as exclusive deity to a, a Hebrew people, but after the theological problems or the theological uh, questions that arise in Babylon, God comes to be known as universal and as having a tender aspect to caring for those he loves. And who does God love? All of creation. It was through God's love that all of creation came to be. 
So when we come back next time, and I think we're ready to head out, it's been about an hour. When we come back next time, we will look at how this gets uh, elaborated in the person of Jesus of Nazareth, as well as in the letters of Paul, but more specifically in the Gospel of John and the letters of, of John. So let me just stop and see if there are any more questions. You're such a quiet group. This wisdom literature is an unsung, it's the unsung beautiful literature of the Bible. It's unfortunate that we don't read it as much. Uh, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, the book of Job, for example, some of the Psalms. Um, so if you have opportunity to read your Bibles, uh, you know, pick up the Song of Solomon and reacquaint yourself with it. Uh, that love between creator and wisdom uh, is exemplified in that book itself. So thank you, everybody. I think we'll end our recording for now, and I'll, I, perhaps I'll see you next Sunday. Thank you for uh, bowing out of the service there on, in the park to uh, join my, uh, my verbal meanderings here. <laughs> so. It's been nice seeing everyone. I'm going to um, stop the sharing. And Thank will, you, Dan. Yeah, Thank you, Dan. Sure, I'll let you go. Enjoy worship. See ya.